Good afternoon, Chief Justice. Uh, how are you this afternoon? Well, thank you. It's a uh, different experience to be on the other side of the bench. <laughs> you have experienced <laughs> what? <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, it's not the first time that you come before this body. Um, Chief Justice, I was in this chair almost exactly 15 years ago. <laughs> A lot has changed since then, eh? Yes, it has. <laughs> um, welcome to these interviews, Judge Van uh, I want to thank you for availing yourself to be considered for one of the positions in the LAC. I will ask you some questions, and some of the commissioners will ask you questions, and uh, all the questions will be aimed at uh, establishing how your track record fits into the selection criteria that this body has adopted for the appointment of judges. Now, you and I have known each other since the 80s, I think. Am I right? Yes. The yeah, a, a long time ago. Uh, okay, no, thank you very much. We are going to start. Uh, you hold uh, a BA and an LLB um, uh, from VETS, is that correct? That's correct, Chief Justice. And then uh, you also have an LLM from Leicester University, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, do you have an MA as well? I think I saw something. Yes. From you have the an MA as well? Um, that was an MA in the Department of Philosophy at the University of the Witwatersrand. Frontiers. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, <coughs> you were admitted uh, as an attorney uh, how, when were you admitted as an attorney? Uh, Chief Was Justice, it uh, 84? Chief Justice, that's correct, 1984. 1984. And you practiced as an attorney continuously until you were appointed as a judge of the Labour Court? Um, no, Chief Justice. Between um, 1986 and 1998, I was um, a corporate legal advisor. Oh, okay. In, okay. In the, um, oh. Oh, and uh, okay. served in that role until I returned to practice in June 1998. And okay, okay. And uh, you then practiced again from 1998 uh, until the time when you were appointed to the Labour Court? That's correct. That was the 1st of January 2009. That was uh, 1 January 2009. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, that was during my time. Yes, um, yeah. Chief Justice, you were then the Judge President of the Labour Courts. Yes. But uh, uh, you have a long history with Labour law, is that correct? Uh, Chief Justice, uh, virtually all my professional life, which <laughs> extends, over almost, <laughs> extends over almost 40 years at this stage, yes. Yes. I know you wrote a book on unfair dismissal at some stage. Uh, is that correct? Or no, that's, that's correct. Uh, that was published in 1994. And believe it or not, yeah. more than 30 years later, it's still referred to oh. judge, in judgments by the Labour Courts. Yes. Uh, but there, there's another one that you wrote, I think, uh, much later than 1994. Uh, I, th I don't know. I think it was meant to be written simple language to assist non-lawyers to understand, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the one in which I wrote the foreword. Oh, that's correct, yes. Yes, Chief Justice. The, the, um, uh, there was a series of legal texts which were, had the title, What You Must Know About. Yes, what yes. What You Must Know About Competition Law, What You Must Know About Collective Bargaining. Um, I wrote the book on uh, unfair dismissal. Yeah. That was published in 2002, yeah. uh, to which you kindly contributed the forward. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, thank you. Uh, so during your time in practice as an attorney and at the time that you were a legal advisor in the corporate world, you were basically um, 
spending most of your time on either advising uh, companies on, on labor law issues or uh, when you are an attorney dealing with litigation as well? Uh, yes, Chief Justice. Well, I must say, in the course of my practice, I probably did more work of a consulting nature than litigation. Yes, but, yes. But uh, in both practice and in the corporate world, I, I was engaged full-time with, uh, with labour law. And yes. But uh, also you were a member of the ministerial task team that uh, drafted the bill that uh, ultimately became the Labour Relations Act that we know. Yes. Uh, in '94. Is that right? Chief Justice, together with you, uh, in August 1994, I was privileged to be appointed by the then Minister of Labour yes. to a, what was called a task team yeah. uh, to prepare a draft bill, which yeah. would serve as the first piece of post-apartheid legislation of, yes. um, of significance. And uh, that became the Labour Relations Act, as we know it. Yeah. Um, in terms of books, we have talked about two books that uh, uh, you, 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 you wrote. Are there others that you have written? Um, Chief Justice, I've written a total of five books. Yeah. Um, the one All we on mentioned, on the, one we mentioned or, or the two we've mentioned, deal with um, unfair dismissal. I wrote a book in the same series, which is what you need to know about employing a domestic worker. Yes. Um, I'm also one of the um, founders and co-editors of uh, what's the standard text yeah. for LLB and LLM students, yes. which is uh, entitled Law at Work. Yeah. And uh, the new edition of that publication is currently with, uh, with the editors. Yes, yes. Um, and apart from uh, books, you have also published uh, numerous articles, uh, is that correct? Chief Justice, I counted over 60 articles which uh, have been published by uh, various labor legal publications. Yes, some, yes. Some, some peer reviewed, some not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I, have, I have contributed chapters yeah. to books uh, yes. on labor law. Yes. Um, when you were still in private practice, did you also ne not have uh, some working relationship with the ILO um, yes, or at I, some stage? Yes, I did, um, Chief Justice. I um, was appointed by the ILO um, to engage in various projects, uh, some of which uh, were in the broader SEDEC area. Yeah. I um, did some work in Botswana on the development of um, a statute to regulate labour relations in the public sector. Yes. I did some work in what's now Eswatini on the development of a basic conditions of employment act. Yes. I also participated in um, uh, training programs uh, in Beijing, in Kuala Lumpur, and, yeah. uh, and in Bangkok. Um, yeah. I also, in, in relation to ILO activity, was the part of the South African delegation uh, to the ILO's conference, which is held in Geneva every June. Mm -hmm. And um, I attended that mm -hmm. uh, first in 1994, when South Africa was readmitted as a member of the International Labour Organization, and um, broadly through until the end of my period in practice, mm -hmm. when um, during which course I sat on the Committee on the Application of Standards, Mm. which in essence is a committee that examines compliance or otherwise by member states with mm. uh, ratified conventions. Mm. Mm. And um, have you counted how many reported judgments you have written as a judge of the Labour Court? Uh, Chief Justice, I tried my best. They're, 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 <laughs> um, they're, they're probably at the stage over 220. O over 220. Judgments which have been yes. reported since I first started acting in the Labour Court. Yes, um, yes. In 1999. Yes. Up until the present. Yes. Well, you have 
certainly been familiar with debates that uh, have happened in our modern labor law from the 1980s uh, into the uh, uh, democratic era. So you, you are familiar with lots of uh, uh, debates that uh, have gone on on certain issues relating to labor law. Is that correct? Chief Justice, that's correct. I just hope that, yes. I, I, hope that I haven't been responsible through my drafting for, for, uh, for some of those debates. <laughs> And um, one, one of those that, uh, one of the issues that have uh, been raging on since the 1980s and continues to rage on in labor law is the question of the jurisdiction of the labor court and the labor and the high court. Of course, uh, prior to, in the 80s, there was no labor court, there was an industrial court, but even then, there, was, uh, uh, there were debates about what fell within the jurisdiction of the industrial court and what fell within the jurisdiction of the, of the high court. Uh, some of us hoped that uh, under the post-apartheid uh, legislation on labor law, that uh, debate would be done away with. Uh, it wasn't done away with, it continues. Would you like to share with the commissioners your own um, understanding of the, uh, the different schools of thought about what should uh, be under the jurisdiction of the Labour Court and what should be under the jurisdiction of the High Court. Yes. Um, Chief Justice, I, I think the original intention when the Labour Relations Act was drafted was to establish a Labour Court or a Labour Court system, being the Labour Court and the Labour Appeal Court, as discrete specialist courts which would have jurisdiction in respect of all employment related matters. Regrettably that's not the way which, uh, in which the Act was finally adopted and uh, in terms of section 1571 the Labour Court has jurisdiction only in respect of matters where jurisdiction is conferred on it either by the LRA or some other statute uh, that gave rise immediately uh, to a series of judgments where um, employees relied, for example, on contractual rights. Uh, the SCA at that time simply held that its jurisdiction hadn't been ousted. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Judge yes. Van Nekerk, I'm sorry. Can everybody hear him? <clears throat> you are able to hear him. Okay, all right. Yes. The SCA held okay. that... The Thank SCA you. held that... Um, its contractual jurisdiction hadn't been ousted by the, uh, by the Labor Relations Act. We then had cases where employees, particularly in the public sector, uh, sought to rely on uh, the constitutional right to fair administrative action and advance claims in respect of employment-related employment decisions by the state in its capacity as employer. Um, it's taken a long time. Um, probably more than 20 years, to get to a point where I think we can now satisfactorily say, after the recent judgment by the Constitutional Court in the Beloy decision, that uh, the Labour Court's jurisdiction is circumscribed, and its jurisdiction is that which is conferred on it by the Labour Relations Act and by any other statute, for example, the Employment Equity Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, so that a litigant coming before the Labour Court must be able to point to the provision on which he or she relies to confer jurisdiction. Um, that has meant that uh, the civil courts obviously retain jurisdiction in relation to contractual disputes where a contract of employment uh, is the subject matter of the dispute. Uh, it also means that the High Court retains jurisdiction in respect of, in respect of uh, most matters which fall outside of the designated purview of uh, the Labour Court's jurisdiction. Whether or not that is satisfactory is something for the legislature perhaps to consider in due course. Uh, I'm aware, Chief Justice, of a judgment uh, written by the Labour Appeal Court uh, probably, what, more than 20 years ago? where the state of affairs was bemoaned and uh, a specific call was made on the legislature to 
clarify the law and to ensure that uh, all employment-related disputes, however they emanate, uh, form the subject of the Labour Court's jurisdiction. But uh, as we speak, uh, that's, that's not the case. No, thank you. And uh, can you also share with the commissioners your understanding of uh, the applicability of the Prescription Act to labour disputes, particularly unfair dismissal disputes, and the different schools of thought there too? Um, Chief Justice, yes, there, there are two broad schools of thought, uh, and they, 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 there's, the divide is sharp. Uh, <laughs> the one school of thought uh, is to the effect that the Prescription Act does not apply at all in any mm. form to mm. the Labour Relations Act. Mm. The other is that, well, it does at least in some respects. Mm. And we've seen these two schools of thought opposing as they are play out in a number of important decisions by the Constitutional Court. Mm. There was the Miateza Metro bus dispute, which involved an arbitration award, which the union had sought to make an order, to make an order of court. Mm. Uh, the Labour Court and the Labour Appeal Court held that the, um, that the award had prescribed. Um, again, we had three judgments in that case, uh, two of them holding that the Prescription Act was entirely incompatible with the Labour Relations Act, uh, a third judgment which sought to reconcile the two statutes. Mm -hmm. uh, we then had the later case of uh, Pyman's Pantry, where um, the issue was not an arbitration award, rather than a claim for unfair dismissal. And again, that had been, the Labour Court had held that uh, the claim had prescribed. Um, the Labour Appeal Court, again, um, writing there were three judgments uh, given in that case. The first uh, two holding that, um, again, the Labor Relations Act and the Prescription Act were incompatible. One of those judgments emphasizing the package that uh, <laughs> the LRA formed, <coughs> and the, the, the checks and balances that were very carefully included uh, during the course of the drafting of that statute and finding that uh, had the drafters intended that the Prescription Act apply to claims uh, which are processed under the Labor Relations Act dispute resolution procedure, well, they, they would have said that. Um, there was a third judgment in the same case which um, found that um, it, uh, a, a claim for unfair dismissal was um, was a, uh, was a debt for the purposes of the Prescription Act, but that on the facts of that case, uh, the claim had not prescribed uh, as, as the Labour Court um, had, had held. Um, there's also there was a further decision, I think, in Hendel, where uh, it was made clear that um, a claim for back pay that attaches to any award of reinstatement um, after a successful unfair dismissal claim constitutes a judgment debt, and uh, the 30-year period of prescription applied in that case. So, um, to, to, to sum up, uh, Chief Justice, we still have one strong school of thought which holds that the Prescription Act uh, does not apply uh, mm. in any way, manner or form. Uh, we have another view which suggests that at least uh, in respect of a claim for unfair dismissal, um, uh, the um, Prescription Act does apply, but that prescription is interrupted once a claim mm. is referred to the CCMA for conciliation. Mm. Thank you. I uh, would like to explain to the Commissioners the difference between a sympathy strike and a secondary strike. Um, Commissioner, a secondary strike is defined by the Act. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a strike in which employees of what we call the secondary employer strike uh, in support of a demand that um, the secondary employer place pressure on the primary employer to meet the demand made by its employees. And these, these typically arise in the case of a, of a supplier-client relationship. Um, a secondary strike is a sympathy strike. Sympathy strike is a term that's very often more loosely used uh, to describe any action in support of uh, action taken by employees of another employer 
but mm. uh, the definition of secondary strike in section 661, I think it is, uh, makes clear what mm. um, a secondary strike is for the purposes of the LRA. Mm. And a grasshopper strike? A grasshopper. A grasshopper strike. Mm. Um, I can't recall that uh, the LRA addresses uh, the issue of a grasshopper strike specifically, or that we've ever had any I, I, cases I, on it. I, but but <laughs> it's 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 known in industrial relations parlance as a mm. as a strike where um, employees across uh, different departments, for example, will uh, will, will strike intermittently. Mm. Um, that's, yeah. that's disrupting uh, the entire business operation, but uh, yeah, to, to the extent that, small, that, that uh, smaller groups of employees are involved on, on each occasion. Mm. Okay. If you are appointed to the Labour Appeal Court, you will find yourself uh, dealing with appeals from the Labour Court, judges of the Labour Court, and uh, sometimes you will be called upon to set aside decisions that they have uh, taken in the exercise of one type of discretion or another. Uh, would you like to share with the commissioners uh, uh, what the two types of discretion uh, are that we have in law and um, explain the difference between them and why that difference is important? Uh, uh, for adjudication. Um, Chief Justice, uh, the, the distinction is one drawn between a wide and a narrow discretion, and perhaps the best way to explain the difference between the two, and uh, this, this is the, the teacher in me, uh, is, is by way of example. Uh, if one looks, for example, at um, Section 193 of the Labor Relations Act, it concerns remedies that may be granted where a dismissal is found to be unfair. In regard to compensation, uh, the Act requires that employees be reinstated. Uh, there's a list of factors which can be taken into account um, to form the basis of an award of compensation. For example, if the employee doesn't want to be reinstated, if reinstatement is not reasonably practicable, or if a continued employment relationship is intolerable. Um, here, what the decision maker, be it an arbitrator or the court, needs to do is to have reference to those statutory factors with regard to the evidence that's been led and, uh, and, and make a decision. In those circumstances, it's open to an appeal court or even a review court to find that the decision is incorrect and to substitute the decision for that of its own. On the other hand, the very next section, section 194, deals with the quantum of compensation and fixes limits on compensation but doesn't otherwise dictate, with reference to any particular factors, how that discretion must be exercised. And there we would talk about a narrow discretion or sometimes called a true discretion where uh, the scope for interference is, is limited. And here an appeal court or, um, can only interfere where the discretion is not exercised uh, judicially or the discretion is exercised capriciously or on the basis of wrong principle or where it's brought about by a, a, a biased judgment. In other words, the, the court's not entitled to interfere only on the basis of correctness that it would have awarded a different amount of compensation. So to that extent, there's difference shown to the decision maker, um, simply because the, uh, the, the, the nature of the discretion uh, is, is narrow rather than broad, uh, as, as applies in the determination of uh, unfair dismissal uh, remedies and the award of the remedy of compensation in particular. Uh, thank you. I think I left out... Uh uh, to ask you, because I think you were a professor of law for quite some time at VETS, is that right? Um, Chief Justice, I've been a professor at the University of South Africa. Oh, uh -huh. uh, I've held professor, visiting professorial appointments at both the law school at the University of, of the Witwatersrand yes. and the University of Johannesburg. Yes, and um, uh, in that capacity, were you teaching labor law? Um, Chief Justice, I was teaching labor law mainly at postgraduate level. 
Yes. At, uh, at both uh, Wits and UJ. Yes. Thank you. I will now give the opportunity to the Judge President of the Labour Appeal Court to put questions to you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon. Judge Good afternoon, Nicky. JP. Um, yes, you've written over, I mean, you've got over 200 reported judgments, over 50 published articles, I think you said over 60, uh, where you've dealt with all aspects of labour law. So I'm not going to test you on labour law knowledge. No. Or, but what I want to ask you is this. One of your earlier judgments, which I thought wasn't only a very important and a remarkable judgment, it's a judgment often cited in the Labour Appeal Court, and that's the Avril Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah. I thought it's a very important judgment. It deals with um, disciplinary inquiries, how one does not need to follow strict formalities. You know. But yet, I mean, after repeatedly emphasizing that judgment, it still appears that the labor law community continues, especially big business, to hold a disciplinary inquiry as if it's a criminal trial. And uh, what does one do about that? Is there any words of wisdom you can give us on that issue? Well, um, Chief <laughs> Justice, yes. Let, let, let me just, as a, as a background to my response, the, the judgment was written, I think when I was uh, still an acting judge. But what, what I sought to do was to place emphasis on the code of good practice relevant to unfair dismissal, which, was, uh, which is an annexure to the Labor Relations Act. And one of, the, one of the concerns raised during the discussions between business, labor, and government, uh, which took place in 1994, 1995, um, was the duplication in disciplinary process. Because uh, by that stage, uh, the industrial court had developed guidelines. Employers were holding uh, disciplinary hearings which would make any criminal court proud, as, <laughs> as, you've, as you've mentioned. The difficulty then is that those disputes would then be referred to the industrial court, nowadays the CCMA, where a hearing would be held from scratch. In other words, the entire process would be duplicated um, and uh, a decision would then be made. And, and I mean, certainly when we drafted the LRA, we weren't aware of any other country in the world that adopted that model. And what that judgment does is simply draw attention to the, um, to the, to the um, code of good practice and remind those engaged in the labour market that primarily justice was to be sought by way of an arbitration in the CCMA, where the employer bore the onus of proof and where it had to prove a case from scratch uh, if it wished to sustain a finding of unfair dismissal. And... Um, as you point out, regrettably, parties have held on to the onerous disciplinary codes and procedures that were developed during the 1980s and 1990s and have been unwilling to uh, embrace the conception of especially procedural fairness that is embodied in, uh, in Schedule 8, the, the, code of, the Code of Good Practice. Uh, whether, whether it's... Um, it's just an unwillingness to engage, or whether uh, there is, uh, wh whether um, employers especially um, find it uh, difficult to, 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 to change and to adopt to a new system, I don't know. I know, it, it is very difficult. I mean, we have, I think, in different occasions, you have spoken at conferences, I have spoken at conferences about this, but it appears that CCMA commissioners of the view that if you don't hold a proper inquiry, it's procedurally unfair. And despite a number of discussions and discussing this case, it doesn't appear that anyone is moving from that premise. Um, Judge President, what's, what's important is, is that the code of good practice is modelled on the ILO Convention on Security of Employment. So it complies with international practice. The, the problem we have in, 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 in this country, frankly, is the degree of duplication. Yeah. So I'm sure we have both, uh, through you, Chief Justice, come across cases where uh, a dispute, uh, a, a disciplinary hearing is conducted before a senior counsel uh, with legal representation on both sides. That, that hearing could go on for anything up to two weeks or more. 
um, a decision is made and thereafter a dispute is referred to the bargaining council or the CCMA in circumstances where that decision simply triggers a referral. It, it, it substantively means nothing. And, and the CCMA or the bargaining council arbitrator then initiates a hearing from scratch, a complete rehearing on the merits. The whole process um, is repeated. And, yeah. and uh, which, which <laughs> makes one wonder what the value of internal processes are. If one looks at the ILO standards, it's, it's, it's simply to afford an opportunity to state a case before a decision on any dismissal or other disciplinary action is taken. It's, it's not what we find in standard disciplinary codes and procedures in this country. And I, I, frank, frankly, I, I think that's, that's costing this, this, this country uh, a lot of money. Some economists have tried to quantify the amounts, but it's vast. I think perhaps something else needs to be done because there's a belief, perhaps uh, wrongly, that um, if you don't hold a full inquiry, you're not having proper procedurally procedural process. And I think despite number of articles and number of conferences where we've discussed this, uh, there is no acceptance that going through not a formal process, but just a process which complies where everyone can explain would be sufficient, you know, the wrongdoing. And, uh, but it's not acceptable, so I don't know, perhaps might require legislation inter intervention because right now it's costing both the employee and employee in terms of time and money, and that is a problem. Then coming to uh, one of the things that's happened over the past few years when I have had not, did not have a deputy uh, to assist me, it's correct that I solicited your help quite often to, to run the labor court. Yes, and so you have been uh, assisting in the running of the labor courts, but also in your past life you were party to drawing of the rules of the labor court, isn't that correct? Well, so um, the rules that now apply, the old rules, yeah. you were party to drafting them. Um, Chief Justice, through you, I, mean, I was appointed to the first, rule, first rules board of the, of the labor court in 1996. Um, and together with um, then Judge Johan Frenemann, we wrote the rules. Mm -hmm. Those um, were uh, superseded by a series of rules that were adopted, if I'm not mistaken, when the Chief Justice was the Judge President of the Labour Court. I drafted those, and uh, as you're aware, JP, there's, uh, the, rules, the new Rules Board was appointed last month, and uh, a... Uh, and a, new set, a new set of rules will will hopefully appear soon. And I, 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 through your kind of and you are involved in the new rules board, and hopefully well, you have a new rules uh, being adopted very soon. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I have nothing further, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, <coughs> CJ, and uh, good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, my question just is one related to what we have seen the PLA um, in their comments saying you are going to serve in that uh, court for four years. Yes. Um, do you think you'll be able to implement your vision and be able to dispense justice in that four years and help that, that court? I, again, through you, uh, Chief Justice Minister, four years is a long time. Um, I hope to be able to draw on um, the skills and experience and expertise that I've developed over the last 40 years uh, to make a contribution to the jurisprudence of the Labour Appeal Court. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner Marumwaha. Thank you very much, CJ. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you, you still remember, but I was in your class in yes. 2012. I recall you, uh, Professor, as one of my <laughs> students here. <laughs> so I'm not going to be dealing with any case uh, with you because I will basically be wasting my time. Um, but I want to ask you an academic question, uh, which I think will be practically relevant in years to come. Uh, when one looks at the pace at which labor law is advancing, and currently when one looks at the, how 
trade unions have been impacted in terms of their membership and how the entire collective bargaining seems to be changing with time. I just want to understand what is your view in respect of what is currently called the fourth industrial revolution and the impact of inter um, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, in as far as the future of collective bargaining is concerned in South Africa? Perhaps it's a more academic question, but I think it will be quite important uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor, and through you, Chief Justice. Um, the fourth industrial revolution and the advancement of artificial intelligence propose, propose profound challenges to a concept of labor law which remains embodied in the personal employment relationship that uh, has characterized uh, labor law for, for decades. Um, one of the difficulties with the LRA in its current form is that it was drafted when times were very different. Uh, it was a corporatist, a corporatist society where business was represented by large employer federations. The unions were, had, had um, major uh, federations with high levels of membership and were influential uh, in uh, the social and political environment. That, that's changed, not only in this country, but, but all over the world. And um, what we've seen in the last 30 years um, is, is, the, is, is, is that model simply no longer being capable of sustaining um, a just regulation of the labour market. We've seen the emergence uh, for example, of platform workers. Um, we, we've seen the emergence of all forms of atypical employment. Again, unions find it difficult to organise workers in those sectors. The consequences being, uh, and again worldwide, a decline in union membership levels. Again, on the employer side, if you look at this country, the major employer federations appear to have fragmented and uh, one is having very different views uh, being presented on the employer's side of the table. So the, the question that arises, and it's a very valid question, is, is, is the LRA still fit for purpose? And the, the answer is probably not. Um, what we have seen is a commission of inquiry or the appointment of a task team every 30 years or so simply to examine labour legislation to determine whether it adequately uh, regulates uh, the labour market so as to give effect to the constitutional values um, of equality, of dignity and of the right to fair labour practices by, by all. Um, perhaps the time has come to reconsider whether the LRA is, as I've suggested, still fit for purpose and whether um, a different form of regulation is required uh, in order to meet the challenges that have been posed to traditional models of employment law, which no longer hold. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you, CJ. Thank you very much. Subject to the commissioners on the virtual platform, I think we have come to the end of this uh, interview. Uh, commissioners on the virtual platform, is there anybody? I didn't see any hand. Is there anybody? I don't think there's anybody. Nothing, thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, thank you. Judge Van we have come to the end of the interview. I must once again thank you on behalf of the commissioners for availing yourself. You are now excused. Thank you, Chief Justice, and thank you, commissioners, for thank the you. opportunity to participate in this interview.